everyone, it's Lisa from Been There, Got Out, and I'm so excited to have Katrina Exloportis, if I'm saying her name right, um, on with us tonight. She's a New Jersey attorney, divorce attorney, there she is, and I know she's going to get on really smoothly because we just made this will work. Yes. There you are. Facing the right way? Yes, you are. Oh, are. You are. So thanks so much for coming. I'm going to have one tiny little photo bomb. I have to do it. Just hand her to me. Um, we have a new puppy. Her name is Rizzo, after the character in Greece. And yes. And the Yankees first baseman. Right. So we have to say hello. And now we can start right. the. She was, the in, she was in a toxic relationship that uh, she just got out of it. And <laughs> she's in a healthy relationship now. <laughs> okay. All right, so with that, we usually have guests who have, like, photobombing cats and dogs, but we figured it now we had ours on purpose. I have a picture of my cat back there. I don't know if you can see him, but it's kind of an embarrassing one, so I won't even, I won't draw attention to it, but he's there. <laughs> okay. All right, so thank you so much, Katrina. Katrina and I have met virtually. She's um, not a fellow New Yorker, but really, really close by in New Jersey, so I always love our, I mean... I like a lot of people, but I love the New Jerseyans or however you guys, whatever you guys call yourself, because your accent is so similar and you tend to be blunt like we are with people. So thanks for coming on. No, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay. So, so Katrina, tell us a little bit about your, your background and then we'll get to the media sure. stuff. So I actually am a fellow New Yorker. I was born and yeah, I was born and raised on Staten Island. I actually only moved to New Jersey May of 2021 after I got married. So I was born and raised 30 years on Staten Island in New York. Okay, so, so um, that's, so there's something there else is, there. It's not, is, okay. That's the connection. So uh, about me, well, um, I am 30. I've been practicing family law for almost six years. My experience has only ever been in family law. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, I've been at the DiTomaso Law Group, the firm I'm at now, since I started practicing in, excuse me, working in private practice, which was, uh, almost five years ago, so I've never left, um, and I love it. I live for my job. It's it's a good, t it's um, hard work, but it's rewarding work, and some, most times it's very gratifying. Yes, and, and I know that you have a background with some uh, domestic violence issues, which is our sweet spot. This is a, our community. Yep, so um, yes, in New Jersey, the domestic violence docket is inundated with cases, right, and um, in New Jersey, as I'm sure with many states, it domestic violence falls under the family law umbrella. So our practice sees a lot of domestic violence cases um, between parties that are going through a divorce during COVID specifically, those numbers were spiked because people were living in a tense situation in the, under the same roof as somebody they were trying to separate from and divorce from. Um, we see it between ex, ex spouses, maybe people that were never married and were once in a dating relationship that are now no longer together, or even people who Whenever together, maybe just have a child in common. Uh, those are all the kind of people that would qualify for a domestic violence restraining order under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act in New Jersey. Yeah. And by the way, before we get to the other stuff, I just found out yesterday from talking to another New Jersey attorney that there is some legislation to prevent victims of domestic violence from being accused of parental alienation. Have you heard anything like that? I have I'm not. like, oh, I've not that's that. really I've interesting. Not. Yeah. That is interesting. I mean, so as part of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act and when you do get a restraining order against um, a spouse or a, 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 a parent of one of the children that you have in common, there's always the opportunity to perhaps uh, limit or restrict parenting time, assuming that that parent presents a risk to the child. But there's always the option as well for that parent to um, appeal the restraining order to the extent that they want parenting time with the child while it's, while it's pending. So I've, I've not heard of that, but I don't say it's not true. I've just not heard it. Yeah. Yeah. I had never heard it before. So I'm going to find out more information Let me know. later. I just wasn't sure if you knew anything about that. I think it's, it's about to be published and, and made uh, public. So yeah. we'll see, we'll see. But, but I heard New Jersey is um, one of the best states for protecting domestic violence victims. I would have to agree. New Jersey is it, uh, as a part of the prevention of domestic violence act. If you get a restraining order against somebody with whom you share a home, you as the victim get to keep the house uh, or get to remain in the home. The victim is, uh, excuse me, the defendant is removed until the restraining order is dismissed. If it is dismissed and if a final restraining order is granted, then you 
you uh, get to stay in, in the home as a, as a victim of domestic violence. Wow. Are, do you know if any other states have that or you don't know because you're just New Jersey? I focus primarily on New Jersey, so I'm really not sure. I don't want to say yes or no. Yeah. Well, I've never heard that before. So that, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. It is great. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, let's talk about the judge. I called it the Judge Judy effect, but it's really the Her Judge favorite. Judy effect on you. So tell it. us the story behind you and Judge Judy. Oh, gosh. So this, this, I'm a big Judge Judy fan. I grew up watching her. And I think, you, Lisa, you and I may have spoken about this. When I was a kid, um, I would watch Judge Judy every day after school because my grandparents or my mom would watch General Hospital at 3 o'clock, and Judge Judy just kind of followed right after at 4. So I watched every day. Um, and I admired her because what, what little girl didn't? You know, she, I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was a kid. And here she was, a powerful woman. She was on TV. She, she knew her stuff. Um, and she was firm. She was confident. So I, I read her book when I was in law school and it really, it was, it was powerful almost because a lot of people, when you hear lawyer, you think, well, I have the right to an attorney because the constitution says so. Unfortunately in New Jersey, there's not a right to an attorney for a divorce, right? So that, that's challenging. And then you hear court is open to the public. That's, that is true. But in a lot of circumstances and particularly for Judge Judy, when she was sitting on the bench in the Bronx, uh, she, the courts were not open to the public and they would shut their doors, family court judges, because they didn't want to be scrutinized for the decisions they were making, particularly because we're dealing with such sensitive topics, dealing with children, dealing with, um, you know, domestic violence, money, things like that. So they were like, public stay out. It's our business. And Judge Judy was absolutely not. You know, she said, come on in. I want to, I will, I will let anybody hear all the decisions I'm making and all my reasons for why. And that actually got her um, got her recognized. I believe she was on a segment of 60 Minutes, but don't quote me. And that her her courageousness uh, led to her her long tenure on TV as a TV judge because she was so bold, and people really respected that about her. That she was un totally unafraid and unapologetic for her her uh, beliefs. Wow! So she's like your your hero. She she is totally my icon. I I she was the only woman I think in her law school class. She was, she was born and raised in a generation where people did women specifically didn't go to college and certainly didn't go to law school. And she was like, I don't care. I mean, I love Ruth Bader Ginsburg for the same reasons. Right. So like judge, but judge Judy was more, um, I guess present, especially as I was younger before I knew that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a person in my law school years. It's judge Judy was it. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So now let's start talking. So you talked about how she made transparency an issue like she opened up the courtroom absolutely um yeah and we always love transparency because that's how we learn sure it's how everybody right. learns that's how, the only reason anybody knows anything is because you don't know what you don't know right so you rely on the wisdom of others to to learn right. right and that's why i have people like you here to help educate people so that they can empower themselves and do things better and more properly as they navigate through this very difficult system absolutely so speaking of difficult system there are, what, tell us a little bit about some of the deficits in the family court system now and maybe how you, your opinion of how they happened or what caused them. So I think the biggest problem that we're facing right now, um, and particularly in New Jersey, is the, the pandemic put such a backlog on, on divorce cases, on family law cases. Um, we're seeing domestic violence trials sometimes taking longer than they would ordinarily because they can't be scheduled as quickly. We're seeing divorces uh, take even longer to adjudicate and to finalize because some people just can't settle their case, right? And so when you can't settle your case, you, I always use the analogy, it's like picking a number at a Wegmans deli counter and waiting for your turn to be called to get a trial date because there's so few and far between. Courts are inundated with cases and we don't have nearly enough judges um, to handle the, just the, the capacity of cases that we have. Um, we're talking in the hundreds, maybe even thousands of divorces that are pending right now across every single county, not just, you know, not across the state, countywide, uh, that, need, that need their day in court. And we're having a hard time getting, getting those days, which is troubling because what happens, again, like I said, you have people living in the same house. New Jersey doesn't require people to move out of the house just because they're going through a divorce. So you can have people living a year, two years, up to three years, if not more, under the same roof as somebody they're trying to divorce from, and they struggle. And that's a lot of times where domestic violence come, becomes an issue. Um, 
and and it's just it is just a an endless cycle of of fighting oh yeah i was going to say most of the states that our clients in different states and countries i i can't think of anyone where somebody has to leave the house during the divorce yeah. without agreeing I've, I've to i've not heard that either house. yeah and and it is really hard. And for a lot of people we know, it's years that they're stuck because the divorce is going on and on. So um, yeah, it's a big problem. I was gonna say, you mentioned um, these thousands of cases. Do you find that there's also a shortage of family court judges? Because I know in Chicago, we have a friend who said that a, a few people retired and now the judges tend to have a thousand cases on their docket at a time. And a lot of our clients will say, um, and in our community will say, the judge doesn't remember, like the judge should remember from last time. And we're like, they're not going to remember anything. Is that true where you are too? Uh, so there's definitely a shortage of judges on the family bench in particular. And that is because another rule in New Jersey is that at 70, the judges are forced, forced in quotes to retire. They could be asked back on recall, but they can't be on the bench past 70. So we have a lot of these judges that are, that are retiring or coming back on recall. And then you know, even those judges that we have, there's just, there's not enough of them to keep up with the, the, the demand and the caseload that's being kind of thrown into the counties. Um, a lot of times they do remember, in my experience, the judges actually do, do remember, but we always, court rules also require us to um, provide with our moving papers if we're filing a motion asking the court for relief, we have to paper the file with everything that's ever happened in the case up till that point. So the judge has all the evidence just in case they may not remember, but the court rules kind of make it so that they have no choice but to remember. That's get interesting because um, a lot of times with motions, we, we find in our experience, in my experience in particular, and also many of our clients and in our community say the judge doesn't read the, the paperwork. And it's like they, you, you get in there and judge says, okay, tell me what's going on. And it's like, oh my gosh, I paid my lawyer thousands of dollars to prepare this motion and the judge didn't even look at it so in my, my experience they the judges are actually reading the papers more i mean and i i try to keep my papers very condensed to the extent i can i don't i will put anything that that i think is relevant that i know is relevant that i know needs to be read or considered but i don't paper the file with every single email i've ever exchanged or every single letter or you know, anything, sometimes it, it's a conversation that you have with your client too, right? I know this seems relevant and I know this seems really important to you, but I promise it's just going to make the judge angry. And no judge wants to read 2,000 pages worth of paperwork if they can avoid it. So um, I try, we try to slim it down and keep it to only the most hard hitting. But in my experience, the judges have, have read the papers thoroughly and they've used that to kind of make their decision in conjunction with oral argument, right? I never like to waive oral argument on a motion, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm really glad you noted that about documentation because you always hear the term document everything. And so many people hire an attorney, and they're like, here's all my stuff. Or they'll be like, I've got 10 binders. I'm going to win my case. And we have to explain to them, we really need to uh, limit this down because you're going to be, first of all, no one's going to listen. And we often talk about how it's like if you have a commercial during the Super Bowl, you have a very limited amount of time, you have to get that in, like the most important thing that the judge is paying attention to, and that's it. Like if you get a, a minute or two to talk, that's it. So you really need to stay focused. So it's going to be important to um, cut the stuff out. That it, it, It's not that it doesn't matter, because it certainly matters and it counts, but in terms of this case, like what's the strongest piece that you have and how does it relate to – the law in terms of what what you're there for absolutely and i tell i tell clients all the time kind of just piggybacking off what you said your lawyer should play two roles right we should wear two hats i have to be your truth teller and i have to be your advocate so i should be telling my clients these hard truths i i know this feels really important to you and i understand and i sympathize but i'm telling you it's, it's not as important as you think right and I, with that if you feel strongly enough that it should be included or it should be brought to the judge's attention at that specific moment in time, I'm happy to do that. And I'm happy to, to, to bring it to the court's attention and fight, your, fight the good fight and advocate for you the best I can. But I, I have to tell you the truth behind the scenes that it's not always going to shake out the way you want it to. And if your lawyer is not telling you those hard truths that you need to hear, it's worth almost getting a second opinion because no case is perfect on either side for any any couple uh, going through a divorce. So you need to know the vulnerabilities that you have in your case or the exposure that you have. Yeah, and, and um, I don't always take questions from the 
the galleys uh -huh. or the gallery, but I just noticed one that I think I could, I, I would like to hear what you have to say because sure. I think it's really broad, but they said, what's the biggest, thing, like most important thing in a divorce? <laughs> broad, right? I, I, I think that depends on, on who you're, on the couple you're dealing with. Um, biggest, most important thing, if the question is what is like most fought like, over? Or most, I would say most relevant to a judge. Like what does the judge care about the most? Well, in New Jersey, we're, we're a no-fault state. So I think it's important. Maybe the answer for me right now is what's not super important. New Jersey is a no-fault state, meaning you can get a divorce for irreconcilable differences, meaning you and your spouse have had uh, differences in your marriage for a period of six months or more, and there's no reasonable prospect of reconciliation. It used to be such that you needed adultery, or you needed extreme cruelty, or you needed abandonment to get a divorce. It's not that way. So sometimes people come in and they say, well, my wife cheated on me, and so I think I'm entitled to A, B, C, and D. And I want the judge to know that my husband's a terrible person because he cheated on me, or my wife cheated on me. And the conversation is, well, it doesn't really matter, right? Right? Like I know it feels important and I'm not trying to minimize your feelings, but I'm telling you that the judge isn't really going to care. Right. Um, but I think a judge, I think a judge wants to see full transparency and complete honesty on both sides. Um, because I think judges are very quick on the uptick when, when they suspect something is awry, when they feel like someone's not being totally honest or someone is trying to play games or throw some sharp elbows to try and get a little leverage in the case. I find that judges are, are quick to pick up on that. And people always think I can, I can cover up my, I can cover it up just enough, right? I can, I can hide what I'm doing, but the truth always comes out. At some point or another, you're, the games kind of unfold. I'm really glad you said that because that is one of the biggest issues that we all worry about is like, why does the other person seem to be getting away with this and nobody sees it? And when is it going to be seen? And when are they going to realize that that person's lying or these are all false allegations? It causes a lot of pain. And we say the same thing. The truth comes out eventually, but sometimes it takes a long time and a lot of money for that to happen. Unfortunately, I mean, I don't say it's an easy process. Sometimes it doesn't come out till trial, but um, it will it will come out. Nobody, nobody gets away completely unscathed in my experience. I've not had that experience yet where someone has marched out of the courtroom feeling this like grand vindication that they got away with everything. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of that, um, you, we were talking about, we, we want to try to avoid trial and sometimes it goes to that, but you, you said why settlement is so much better. And we know it's really hard with a lot of these cases, but we know that also 90 uh, from a lawyer in Chicago who told us 98% of cases do settle even the high conflict ones. So tell us why settlement is way better than going to trial if you can avoid trial. Statistically, that is correct. About 98% of cases do settle. Um, and it's better for a lot of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, you're in control of your own fate, right? You, there is no, there are no two people or one person in the world better to decide how the rest of your life shakes out than you and your future ex-spouse. And that includes a judge. Judges are smart and they do this for a living and they know the law and they, they know the facts as you present them. But at the end of the day, they sit in a black robe on a bench and they're not, they don't live your life post-judgment the way you do, right? So you're in a better position as an individual and as a, as a couple that is separating to make a decision that's going to impact the rest of your life because you're going to live it. And your kids, if you have children, are going to, to live it. Um, the, the other, the cost is obviously another another aspect, right? It is a much more cost-effective way of ending your marriage is to, is to settle because you're not spending tens of thousands of dollars in trial prep and tens of thousands of dollars in participating in several days worth of trial. And you get to make the delays. <laughs> and delays, inevitable delays. Um, you know, you, you can handle it on your own and it gets done much, much quicker. I have clients sometimes that, are successful in going to mediation with a mediator without lawyers. And they come back to us at the end of the day and they say, this is what we agreed to. I just need you to make it, make it legal ease. And I'm okay with that because that makes their lives easier. It makes my life a little bit easier. Um, and the other, the other part of it is judges are really limited in what they can do. Meaning they have, they have to follow the black letter of the law. They don't have the flexibility in entering orders the way that you do uh, with your attorneys in crafting a settlement agreement. And a perfect example is when it comes to distribution of a home. If two people can't decide what happens to a house, in all likelihood, the judge is going to order it sold at the end of a trial. 
he's not going to find that one party is more entitled to it than the other, right? The other, what he's, he's not going to order a buyout and say, okay, ma'am, you can keep the house, refinance for X amount of dollars and buy out your husband. He's going to say, list it for sale in 30 days. He or she is going to say, list it for sale in 30 days and split the proceeds after you, you know, divvy it up amongst the realtors and the closing costs and commissions. Um, and that's, that's something that you have a lot of flexibility with in, in manufacturing a settlement agreement. Yeah, and, and as you're talking, I'm thinking one of the biggest issues that we see is with parenting plans or visitation agreements that often judges will give a blanket thing without all the details. And so one of the things we do with our clients is really get into the details of what we call high conflict parenting plans that you will never get from a judge because they don't have time. They don't know your individual schedules. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect example is, again, is parenting plans. You know, how much time do you guys get for vacation every year? How do the holidays get split? Who picks vacation years? And, you know, do I pick in even years and you pick in odd years? And on, on what date and for how long? These are all like they're minutia that don't necessarily get addressed at the, in, in trial, but will absolutely be addressed in settlement. Right. And all. Also, with parenting plans, there's things like certain traditions that fall outside the general major holidays that most Americans, particularly, even though I know it's not just Americans watching this, but we have like certain things that are standard, but a lot of families have different people's birthdays or stuff regarding weddings, overseas travel, relocations that won't be mentioned. And so for a number of people in this community, they have to keep going back to court because they don't have something that was written properly the first time. I think, I, and to, to that point, I think, I don't know the exact statistic, but there is a statistic that says parties that go, uh, have their, their divorce finalized at the conclusion of a trial are more likely to engage in post-judgment litigation to address the issues that were not addressed by a trial court decision uh, divorcing two, two people. So if you can settle your case, you can hopefully, uh, nothing's to stop somebody from not adhering to the terms of a settlement agreement, but the hope is that if you would have addressed everything that you know to be a concern for you and your specific set of circumstances that a judge may not. Right, and also we find um, in our experience that when you settle, it makes it harder to appeal because a judge can say, well, you guys came up with this together. So with a contentious person where they'll want to keep changing things, from what we've seen, judges will say, wait a second, you just made this agreement. Go away for a year and a half for two years and then come back if there's a real problem with a really strong case. But otherwise, like, we're not appealing this. Yeah, so in New Jersey, uh, appeal is, is an interesting term because appeal means going up to the higher court and having something reversed as, a, as an error of law or an error of uh, mis, you know, misprocedure, if that's the term. Mm -hmm. um, but what we find a lot of times is people do try to come back and modify their settlement agreements. And there are different standards of law to be applied depending on what is sought to be changed. So if you're looking to change a support obligation, the case is Lepis versus Lepis, and that's a, a, a substantial change in circumstances. If you're looking to change a parenting plan, you know, well, why? You agreed on this parenting time. What change in circumstances has occurred and why is this change you're demanding in the best interests of your child? Um, but yeah, it is, it is harder for sure because these settlement agreements are viewed to be contracts and they're, they should be adhered to or they try to adhere to them um, to be with basic contract principles in mind. And that is, I intend to be bound by the terms of this contract. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of contracts, in family court, you I think you had said there's, um, you know, people have to do very specific uh, retainers or maybe we didn't talk about that, but I know the retainer is a big thing. And mm -hmm. so let's talk about Billing. What is it like for you telling people about how they have to pay their bill? Because we know a lot uh, of people don't pay their it's, bill. It's it, it's not a comfortable feeling. I think people have this perception of attorneys as being like money hungry, trying to trying to take every dollar we can out of people's pockets. It's just not true. I I, I encourage my clients to to settle their case in the most cost effective way possible to the extent that's even possible, right? It takes two people to settle a case. It takes two people to to agree that certain things need to happen to bring the case to a conclusion. It is not just let me wave my magic wand around and make this case disappear, you know, and make everybody go away. Um, so when I have to have it, when my bill has to be paid, it's an uncomfortable discussion, absolutely. But um, come, it's kind of par for the par for the course, for lack of a better term. I mean, it's it's how I. 
I work for a firm, we have business expenses, you know, and that's what we tell clients. It's not, it's not personal, but it's, if I do, if we're doing work and we're dedicating so much time and hours into a case, we need to be paid to keep our business going. Right, right. Right. Now, what about when people ask the question, how long is this going to take? And I'm thinking of our people in particular. <laughs> yeah, there's no good answer for that. And it goes back to what I just said. The answer is as long as it takes for you and your soon to be ex spouse to agree or to get a trial date. And we know trial dates could be years away, but two people have to want to settle their case to make it end quickly. You know, we've got cases that, it, that lasted five, six, seven years in this office before there was a conclusion. Um, and then we have cases that last a matter of six or eight weeks because they come to me with an agreement already kind of manufactured between them and me and another lawyer make it pretty. We get it signed. We file it off with the court and they're divorced. Yeah. Um, so there's no good answer. And I tell that to people all the time. It takes two people to settle a case. There's no magic wand. There's no crystal ball. There's no magic that I can do. As much as I like to think I'm, I, I have these powers, I don't. I just, uh, my hands are tied unless somebody, somebody's willing to make a concession. Yeah, and that's, so I guess the same thing regarding cost. How much is it going to cost? Same, same, same thing. Same thing. I can tell you what the retainer is. I can tell you what my hourly rate is. And then beyond that, I have no doubt. I can never give a dollar amount to tell you how much a divorce is going to cost because it just doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay, and then um, I quoted you. I don't know if you saw this morning. Divorce it, is one long it, business decision. It, tell it us is. about that. It is. And I... I don't mean to sound insensitive when I say it, and I recognize that maybe it does sound a little bit insensitive, but the truth of the matter is sometimes people fight over principle, um, and it, it's a, it becomes a question of what is that principle worth to you? And I, I encourage clients to do a quick cost-benefit analysis. You know, cost, what are you looking to get, and how much is it going to cost you to get there? If we're talking about fighting over $5,000, and it's going to cost you ten to get the five it's probably just not worth fighting for, right? So you have to think of it almost as a business decision. Think of the resources you have, especially if you don't have unlimited resources, and most, a lot of people don't. We're, you know, we're talking about people who operate on a budget. If you don't have unlimited resources and you need to figure out what's important to you and what you're gonna, what you really truly need, allocate those resources to what's most important to you. Don't fight over the little stuff. I've had people fight over things as simple as a little tight basketball hoop for a couple hundred bucks. And I'm like, it's gonna cost me, you, more money to have me fight over that than it would to just go buy a new one. But that's the principle we talk about. Some people just, they wanna know that they won, for lack of a better term. And so yeah. it's a business decision in that you have to figure out what, you're, what you want, how much it's gonna cost to get that, and what is, you know, what's most, most important to you to, to spend those resources on. Yeah, we often use the term the cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that before? Yeah. I okay. Use it at least All right. Times a day. <laughs> no exaggeration. Okay. All right. So um, you mentioned a little bit about mediation. I'm guessing we already know your thoughts. What do you think when it's uh, a really high conflict case? Do you think it's still worth trying to mediate? I, Have you seen really difficult cases? And then the other part to this is, do you think it's beneficial to have attorneys there versus not having them there? It's a lot of moving parts to that question. Um, I think. I always think mediation, nine out of every 10 times, I think mediation is worth a shot. You have some cases, I've had them where I have two people that are diametrically opposed, are not willing to budge off their position, have maybe been before mediators before, and it's, it's just proven ineffective. And in that case, I don't encourage you to keep going back because that's a waste. But if every mediation session inches you a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer, I do think it can be helpful. Um, especially in those high conflict cases, you know, where, where there maybe is a lot, a lot more to fight over. Sometimes there's a better way to finagle an agreement with finances in particular. Um, if we're talking about whether or not attorneys should be there, it really depends on the two people that are mediate that the two parties. Tell us um, and the pros and cons, pros and cons of attorneys being pros and cons pros. You have your attorney in your pocket telling you if something is equitable, if something is reasonable, if something is worth your while, Whereas a mediator is an unbiased third party, not there to represent your interests or your spouse's. Cons is that it's going to cost you a lot of money. And sometimes an attorney is um, more aggressive, right? And maybe not, I never know with my adversaries. I mean, you get experience with your adversaries, but they could be very aggressive. Maybe they could be the ones driving the bus and they could be 
telling their client, no, 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 don't take that deal. I could get you a better deal at trial. So you, you never really, you never know um, what's going to be. Yeah, I know in my own experience um, during the divorce process, in the very beginning, my attorney said, go in without me and pretend that you don't even have an attorney. Play dumb. And that worked out really well for me because we got the parenting plan done. We didn't get a bunch of other stuff done, but we did come to settlement like two weeks before trial after a year of stuff. So, um, but my attorney said he thought it was helpful for us to do it without attorneys at the time because he thought that it would be disarming for me to come in without one. And he was right. 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 You know, it's interesting that you say that because in New Jersey, there's a court sponsored custody and parenting time mediation that parents have to attend that is without attorneys. So the hope is obvious. Oh. Yeah. So it's interesting that your attorney told you that because New Jersey kind of forces that as well, where two people go and they mediate with a court, a member of court staff, a court mediator to try and negotiate custody and parenting time alone. And sometimes they come out with an agreement and that's done. And then mediation is just the economics. And with a court appointed mediator like that, is do the parties have to pay for that? Or is that nope, just it's part a, of the court thing? Court, it's a court sponsored program. Yeah. It's a wow. Court that's program. awesome. Court staff. Courts also do, at some point in New Jersey, you get to what's called early settlement panel. And that's another court sponsored effort to help you resolve your case. But after participating in, we call it ESP, the court sponsors two hours of free economic mediation with the mediator of the party's choosing. Wow. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's an attorney in the state of New Jersey. Generally, the first hour is them kind of getting themselves caught up on the file. But the second hour is actual mediation with or without attorneys. Um, and whatever the free time is used for, it's beneficial because it's time that you would otherwise be billed for. That is amazing. That's Economic amazing. Mediation, but yes. That, is that's incredible. Because I know where we were, it was $900 every mediation session. Oh, no. Well, for, for two hours. Actually just get there. Yeah. But if you can settle wow. your case in that first two hours, kudos. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we talk about, you know, how it does take two people to settle a case and often our people are dealing with a high conflict X. So do you have any tips on how to push someone towards settlement either in or out of mediation? And I know we'll probably use the word leverage. I, I, leverage is your best bet. I mean, there has, there's always a, there's always a, a point that so you can, you can use to leverage somebody. Um, but it, it's not really a great answer because some people are just so firm against settlement and you have to make it, you just have to do your best to make it enticing to them. And whether it's at a little bit of extra parenting time, sometimes, sometimes it's a dollar amount to make it, to make it all go away. Um, but you, it's really about finding the pain point of a particular individual and, and kind of trying to capitalize on that. That's a great line. Yeah. <laughs> it's, true. Um, it's true. Yeah. And a lot of times, Sometimes it has to do with money. We find at least with our people. Money. Yeah, I need to say that because there are there's generally there are children involved, but I I, I would agree there it tends to be a dollar amount that makes it uh makes the whole thing go away. Yeah, it's sad, but that's it is what it is. Sad and true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Katrina, I can't think of any other major questions I have for you. Is there anything else you want to say? And if not, how can people find you? I know you're just New Jersey, I right? I'm just New Jersey for now. I'm hoping by the summer I will be licensed in New York as well. Um, but no okay. promises. I, I don't I don't know anything about New York, so I'm I'm gonna just get my get my feet wet. But for now, um, you I'm at D Tomaso Law Group in Warren, New Jersey. Uh, the website is dtomasolawgroup.com. Commission by email. My email is Katrina at dlgfamilylaw.com. Um, like I said, I've been here for for five years. I love it here. Probably will never leave. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's how you guys can find me. And my Instagram is, is, is around here too. I think it's on the top of the live. It's private. It's my personal Instagram, but you can always send me a message there and I'm happy to help. Oh, thank you so much, Katrina. Thank you, Lisa. It was a pleasure. Okay. Same. So we'll stay in yeah, touch. Absolutely. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye.